assume that means there's no announcements to be made. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, let's go. Come on. Don't need me. You need my permission. Let's go. <laughs> I'm bugging you again. The uh, time is running out. We are having our Thanksgiving dinner in two weeks. So, number one, if you have not signed up to say that you can attend, we need a, a good head count. There is still one of the, uh, the little slips. Please fill it out today. And there's a, a red bowl out there in the, in the hallway. And we also have the sign-up sheet for what you would like to bring to uh, put in with our dinner. And if you to do that today also, I would appreciate it. But we'll let you slide from next week. That's the latest. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I hope you all are considering
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have done to one We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have justly deserved the present and eternal punishment.
body of your Son, Christ our Lord. May we also follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, so that we may come to those unspeakable joys which you have prepared for those who love you. This we ask for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain, mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not being consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel, say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called
called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This is the word of the Lord. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in the one God, the Father Almighty, and the Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things in this world.
Moses has every reason to just keep on going, I suppose. See, after all, he's got to get the flock home by 8 o'clock or else, you know, miss dinner. But, um, but he sees this bush and it's burning and it's not being consumed and there's something not quite right about it. And he turns aside. And that is what I'm calling this morning the divine interruption. And I want you to see how this divine interruption functions in the book of Exodus, first of all, so that you can see how God's divine interruptions are functioning in your life. Though it may not be a bush that is on fire without being consumed, probably, it, it hasn't been. Yet, hopefully, by the end of this sermon, you will be more aware of all of those burning bushes that God is putting into your life. And hopefully, by the end of this sermon, you'll be more ready to turn aside. It says, I will turn aside to see this great sight. When God interrupts you, it's always great. Right, so... We live in a day and age, uh, I believe, where it's in vogue to be searching for God. If you go check out the bookshelves, the, the Christian or spiritual section at Barnes & Noble, uh, just kind of look over the titles and subtitles of all the books you'll see there. Tons and tons and tons and tons of books about searching for spiritual truth or searching for God. It's a time of searching. I wonder how many of those books would still be on the shelves if they were titled something more like Having Found God, or Finding God, or Knowing That You Found The Truth. And having Found God, or, or Being Convinced That You've Got, that, that You Found The One True God. That's not so much in vogue today. We're more of a searching group than a finding group. In fact, I might suggest that those who are kind of addicted to searching are maybe searching in fear of actual finding. But I want to point out the first thing this morning, and that is that Moses did not set out in search of God. He didn't wake up that morning and say, hey, I know i got some sheep to take care of, but I think I'll also, while I'm at it, look for God. In fact, I'm convinced as I read through the, the first three chapters of Exodus, I'm convinced that what we have here in chapter 3 is Moses' conversion story. You may not know this if you don't know the first two chapters of Exodus as well as you'll know them after today's Bible class. Um, but Moses was, um, uh, culturally speaking, pretty much an Egyptian and a murderer. So Moses is basically on the lamb. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's, he's escaping the law. And he's, he's been on the run for probably 40 years in the wilderness here. Hard to say that he's been searching for God. In fact, I could probably say he wasn't searching for God. God found him. And I want you to know, first and foremost, that that is how all of us find God. He finds us. And he's constantly searching for us. He's constantly needling little things in our lives. He's creating divine interruptions, ways for us to turn aside from the ordinary, everyday pattern of life and see this great sight to find something, to find him, to find what he's doing, to find his purpose, maybe even especially his, his purpose for you. Now, I can't think of a better group of people to be divinely interrupted than a crowd of retired folk. But the problem with being retired is you just get so into your routines. Just like Moses. He's got his flock. 
walking the same path he's probably been walking for 40 years. But on this day, who knows? Maybe he's passed by that same bush dozens of times. Maybe it was even a flame. But on this day, he turns aside. So the first important thing that you must do if you're going to see a great sight, you've got to be willing to turn aside. You've got to be willing to do something a little different, out of the ordinary, out of the routine, away from the paradigm that you've established for yourself. That's how God interrupts us, and uh, that's how God interrupts uh, Moses. So I, I, I'm speaking to a few retired folk. Not all of you are retired. Uh, I, I, I'll have a story in a little while in my sermon for those of you who are not retired, so I won't leave you out. But what is exactly a divine interruption? What is a burning bush in our lives? If, if we can safely say that none of us has ever encountered an actual bush actually on fire, actually not being consumed, which is a great sight, what are those burning bushes that we encounter? And I want to suggest to you this morning that they come in a variety of different ways. The first kind of burning bush that I'm going to suggest to you is that sometimes God interrupts us the person. And here's the story. I know a pastor who pastored a church in New York City. And he told this story about a woman who had joined his church. And he asked her, what brought you to Redeemer? And she told her story. She said that she worked in the, uh, in, she worked for a, one of the news agencies based in New York City. So she had a I think what sounds like a pretty high-pressure kind of a job, corporate atmosphere, uh, pretty aggressive kind of industry, um, a what have you done for me lately kind of industry, an industry where you got to worry about your image and your reputation and your performance constantly, you're on camera and all the rest. And uh, she said that she had done something in her job that was of such a massive mistake, it was such a huge blunder <laughs> that she was certain she would be fired, that she deserved to be fired, the mistake that she made. But the reason she wasn't fired was because her boss took the blame. Her boss literally claimed that the mistake was his and not hers. And now, she had never experienced anything like this before. In fact, her experience quite specifically was that you could count on a boss to lay blame on those underneath the boss. In other words, she had encountered bosses and the corporate infrastructure and the corporate culture and the, the dog-eat-dog -dog environment. She had encountered that as, you know, eat or be eaten. So that in the, if something, the mistake, if a boss made a mistake, that boss was likely to pan the blame on, on one of his underlings or hers. She had never encountered a boss willing to be a blame taker for something that he had nothing to do with. And so she went to, to thank him, and I, you know, kind of a non-corporate thing to do, I suppose. She went to thank him and to try and find out what it was that motivated him, and, and he just kind of sh shrugged it off and said, you know, I just did what anyone person would do, and she said, no, 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 I've known a lot of these persons, but I've never had this. I've never had anything like this happen before. And finally, she broke him down, and he said, well, I'm a Christian, and I did for you what I believe that Jesus has done for me. I mean, I believe, because I'm a Christian, I believe that Jesus on the cross suffered the punishment. He, he presented the gospel in very clear terms to her about how Jesus became the substitutionary atonement for his sin. He became a blame taker instead of a blame giver. And she was so moved by that, she asked, well, where do you go to church? And he said, Redeemer. And the next thing she knew, there she was. He was a burning bush to her. And she turned aside to see the great sight. He had become a burning bush because he had essentially interrupted her normal expectation. The normal course of events in her life were completely interrupted by a person. So 
So you can think it through for yourselves. I'm quite certain that we have had such people come to us, even just in my year and a half being here. We've had people come to us who we've never met before. They've come to us. And I believe that to some extent, those, those are, are divine interruptions. Those are people who, who enter our midst. And God is saying, are you going to notice them? Are you going to turn aside from the normal way that we do things around here, which is maybe just to shake a hand on Sunday morning, and then not even think about the person until next Sunday, and then, oh, oh, that's right. What was your name again? That isn't turning aside at all. That's just going about the normal routines of things. But to truly turn aside and say, what is this great thing? What, who is this person that God has placed in our midst? And why? How is God exposing to me a greater purpose? How has God just found me through this person? But it happens in church, it happens in, at work, it happens in retirement, it happens in life. I believe God is doing it on a constant basis. But you've got to turn aside. You've got to be able to be interrupted by God. Oh, you'll blame it on the person. Well, this person's a big burden to me right now. No. It's God who's becoming a burden through that person. For your own benefit. So that you can live a greater purpose than the one that you're just navigating yourself. So people, I think, can be a divine interruption. I think that I think that God also works through thoughts, trains of thought. And maybe this is a little bit stranger, but uh, it goes to figure because I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more personally, and this is how God, I think, works through, through how this is how God finds me very often, is through um, uh, interrupted thoughts, or thoughts that are interruptions. Um, I'll give you a, the, the, the big example in my life, the, 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 the kinds of thoughts that have so convicted me about the reality, the true presence of God in the world. And it, it sounds something like this. It, it's uh, I'm no different than anyone else in, in that I don't necessarily see, I mean, I, I don't see bushes burning and not being consumed. I don't see the miracles. I don't see the, you know, the mountains being moved. And, and I, don't, I don't see the miraculous. I've never seen a person walk on water before. I don't, I don't get to see that stuff. And I... At one point in my life, along with a lot of other people, they, they take that as a sort of evidence that God isn't real. And that the stories of the Bible are maybe somehow more mythological at best. And yet, something about the existence of love and and this is something that happens inside. That's why I call it a, a, a thought, a train of thought. And the more I begin to think about the, the presence of love in my life, of joy in my life, of, of things that don't have chemical explanations, as such that I begin to wonder, well, so if, if this life is all there is, if there's no before and there's no after, you just die and that's it. There's no above and there's no below. It's just this life. Then what place does compassion have in a world like that? There, there is really no good reason for kindness. You can see it in the, in, in, in the, in the animal world. A wolf is hungry, a wolf kills. And it's essentially good. It keeps wolves going. And, you know, by some miracle, I suppose, although I would have never called it a miracle, there remains enough food for wolves. They haven't killed at all. And I began to think, well, why aren't human beings more like that? Why are my parents so kind to me and so loving? Why is my wife put up with what she puts up with? I don't know. I, I wasn't thinking that at the time. But, I mean, you could ask that question. 
question. How have I been such the object of grace, kindness, mercy, compassion, love, joy? Where does it all have the Lord? There's no explanation for it if all that, that exists is this 85 years of life. In fact, if I really believe that, if I really believe that the only thing that exists is my 85 years, I have no reason to be kind to anyone because there is no greater value than myself. Your life isn't more valuable than mine. Not under that kind of paradigm. And so I begin to think these thoughts and to realize that the, the, it doesn't make any sense that there could be nothing more than just what I can see and touch and taste and experience. There, there must be something more, I thought. And that opened up to me. That was the divine interruption that opened up to me the possibilities that then became Christian faith. So, again, I, you got to turn aside when those kinds of, when, when your thoughts are occupied with a thing that can't be if everything else you think must be true, and yet this thing is true also, that's probably a burning bush. Turn aside. Slow down. Cancel a few appointments and think about it for a little while. Well, maybe a third category, I'll say, and that'll be the last one. I came up with quite a few for this sermon, but I'll only share these three with you. I think um, maybe the most popular, the most frequent kinds of burning bushes that God puts in our lives are troubles. Most of us, most not all of us, but most of us have established a, a way of life, a, a, a general working day-to-day -day operation that for the most part uh, keeps us safe from trouble. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us have uh, an income, a working income that keeps us fed and clothed and housed. Um, we've got a fair sense of what the future might look like financially, for instance. Or we have, uh, you know, there, uh, you know we've, got, we've, we've established that we've surrounded ourselves with the, with the right kinds of people so that uh, so that we, you know, our, our emotional and uh, social day-to-day uh, -day life is more or less what we want it to be. And if something interferes with that, we have our ways of, of moving aside those things that are interfering with the life that we want. But what happens when trouble comes into your life that... that, that you didn't plan for it. In fact, that you planned against it, and yet it comes. Our friends in Florida just experienced one. And I believe that trouble, trouble, especially trouble when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, trouble is a burning bush. It's God asking you to, to look aside, to, to, to turn away from your normal routine and to take a break from it all and to look at him and to ask him and to get into a dialogue with him. Exactly what Moses does here. Next thing you know, he turns aside from his normal day-to-day -day routine, the routine that he knows is going to get him home on time, the routine that he knows is going to keep his sheep safe, the routine that he knows is going to protect his family and protect his reputation and keep the thing rolling, life rolling. He turns aside from it. And the next thing he knows, he's in dialogue with the creator of the universe. Please, when you encounter a burning bush, a, a divine interruption, turn aside, slow down, allow yourself to be interrupted, because God is knocking at your door. What do you find there? Well, it's kind of funny what Moses finds. He finds, first of all, that he's standing on holy ground. But, and, and so, like, you know, remember, the Lord says, take your shoes off, the ground. don't come anywhere near, don't, you know, stop, like, don't come any closer. The, the ground on which you're standing is holy. You get any closer, it's going to be way too 
too holy for you. That's the idea of holiness. The idea of holiness is be afraid of God, be very afraid. Because he is so pure and he is so perfect and he is so holy that just to be near him is to be burnt to a crisp. I, you know, it's, it sounds stark, but there are plenty of more texts that say the exact same thing. It's what we need to understand. God's holiness is to be feared. Are you okay with that? His holiness is to be feared. And your not holiness is the problem. So it's kind of ironic that he turns aside and the first thing God says is don't go any nearer. But that's not all that God says to Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. And again, it doesn't, may not come through quite all that well in English, but I want you to know that in Hebrew, whenever a thing is doubled like that, it, it's because it's in, there's an emotional amplification of what's being said. So, uh, you know, when, when Jesus says, Simon, Simon, he, he, he's trying to establish a connection. Mary, Mary, Martha, Martha. You know, David says, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. There's an emotional connection that's suggested by the doubling of a Hebrew word. And it's not just true for names either. It works with all kinds of things. When in the Hebrew Bible, when, when, the, when the pits that people fall in are very, very deep pits, they're not very, very deep pits in Hebrew. That's what they sound like in English. In Hebrew, they sound like this, pit pits. Because the word gets doubled, so that there's an amplification. And when God says, Moses, Moses, he's not just calling him his name. He's calling him into relationship with himself. And so not only does Moses encounter God in, in this interruption, he encounters the, the holy being, the holy creator, the, the, the God to be feared. But he encounters the God who, who loves him. The God who, who hasn't burnt into a crisp, even though the ground he is standing on already is holy already. And so though it's correct, it's right, it's proper to fear God's holiness, you, please don't stop there. Also hear his mercy and hear how he loves you. Hear him say your name twice. He's calling you to a deeper and more meaningful life with him. And if you know anything about Exodus chapters 4 and following, you know that God called Moses into quite the life. Have you encountered a burning bush lately? Have you turned aside? Have you stopped and listened and entered into a dialogue with the Lord God, your Savior? Because yes, he is holy, but he is also merciful. And if you just, the, the, here's the, by the way, the presence of Jesus Christ in this text. And I, I, I can't let you miss it. But throughout the Old Testament, you'll every now and then you'll run into an angel of the Lord. You know that, the angel of the an, an angel of the, an angel of Yahweh will pop up and will say something or do something. And every time an angel of Yahweh pops up, the person he pops or she pops up in front of is always afraid, afraid always dropping down on their knees or on their face like this, uh, always kind of trying to start worshiping. These angels are piercing creatures. But if you'll track it, if the text says it is an angel of the Lord, the angel will always say, no, 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 don't worship me. Don't worship me, I'm just an angel. But if the text says that it is the angel of the Lord, that doesn't happen. Because in the Old Testament text, the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. It is Jesus himself. Of course, it's the, it's the word of God. Moses is speaking with God, but he's speaking through a mediator. And that mediator is the angel of the Lord. It is Jesus himself who not only knows Moses, but knows that one day he will die for Moses. That's who's 
met Moses in the bush. The very man who will one day die for Moses' unholiness. And that's the one who mediates the word of God. So when you've seen the bush, when you've been divinely interrupted, listen for the voice of Jesus. Because it will always be the same. It will always be, I have suffered and I have died for you. I have taken the blame for you. I have paid the price for you. And he will speak your name in love. He won't lay that on you as a burden of guilt. He will remind you of it so that he can lift you up and send you back into a greater life than the one that you were tracking on before you were interrupted from it. And that, I suppose, is the very meaning of his name. I am who I am. And we all want, this is the problem with the seeker generation. We all want to find a God that we can define. It's as if God reveals himself to Moses and says, well, you want to know my name? My name is I am who you want me to be. That is who he is. So don't, don't expect that. Don't try and force him to be who you want him to be. If you do, you'll never get divinely interrupted. Let him be who he is. Because when you meet him as he is, you're saved. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses understanding in your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus. Amen. We say.
We pray for the various ministries of our congregation today. We especially remember those uh, staff and volunteers who give their time and energy so that the gospel might continue to go forth from this place. Uh, through, the, through their faithful gathering, Lord, may you multiply their efforts that many more might come to a saving faith in you, Lord, in your mercy. Finally, we ask you that you would sanctify our homes with your presence, reminding us that nothing can separate us from your love. Unite us as families in love toward you and each other. We also remember and ask your blessing on those who struggle and suffer with uh, diseases and illnesses of mind and body and spirit. Uh, we ask that you would uh, comfort those who have recently lost. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen faith in you so that uh, even in the times of trouble, uh, you might continue to be worshipped by your people. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, we commend all of those for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power,